Pressure is everywhere. Pressure is mathematically defined as the force over the area which the force is applied. But pressure is a very broad term that can describe a wide range of phenomena. Specifically, we will be examining thin-walled pressure vessels. A few examples of these would be a propane tank, a balloon, a football, and a bicycle tube. As engineers, we want to understand how these thin-walled pressure vessels work and what forces and stresses they experience. A thin-walled pressure vessel is defined as an object in which the radius is at least 10 times greater than the thickness of the wall. This assumption simplifies stress calculations because the forces inside the walls can be ignored. The most frequently seen applications are cylindrical and spherical vessels. One of the most commonly seen thin wall pressure vessels is a soccer ball. So before we talk about soccer balls, we're going to be talking about this thing called hoop stress. Hoop stress is mathematically defined for a spherical pressure vessel as the internal pressure times the radius divided by two times the wall thickness. Physically, this manifests as how the circumferential stress in the thin wall pushes against the internal pressure to maintain equilibrium. This holds the pressure in the ball and keeps it inflated. In order to arrive at the expression for hoop stress, we will take a look at the cross section of the spherical pressure vessel shown. To start, we will take the same approach as you've seen in your physics and mechanics problems. We will begin by drawing the free body diagram of the cross section. Drawing the internal pressure as arrows pointing in the negative x direction across the cross section. This is denoted as P. To maintain equilibrium, we will draw arrows acting in the positive x direction along the circumference of the thin wall. This will be denoted as sigma, the hoop stress. Continuing with the static mechanics approach, we will set the sum of the forces in the x direction equal to zero. Since we know that pressure is equal to a force divided by area, we can define the force acting in the negative x direction as internal pressure P times the area of the cross section pi r squared, where r is the radius of the circular cross section. Next, we can define the force acting in the positive x direction as the hoop stress sigma times the circumferential area, which can be defined as the thickness T multiplied by the circumference 2 pi r. Plugging these forces into the equilibrium equation, we can solve for sigma, the hoop stress. This will simplify to pressure times the radius divided by two times the thickness. This is hoop stress. So a soccer ball is gonna react differently depending on the hoop stress that it experiences. This is why FIFA has created the standard pressure range for soccer balls. For a size five soccer ball, the standard pressure range is 8.5 to 15.6 PSI, or pounds per square inch. If the hoop stress is above or below this standard pressure range, it will experience non-ideal behavior. Ideal behavior is important because players want to know how the ball will react when they kick the ball, and they want it to react predictably. Today, we're going to vary the pressures and keep the radius and thickness the same, also known as using the same ball. This will result and varying hoop stresses. If the hoop stress is too low, the ball won't travel far when passed. This will also affect what will happen when the ball is shot or punted. If the ball is overinflated, it will experience a hoop stress that causes the ball to be much harder to control. Now let's take it to the field and observe these various conditions. Now we will look at the effects of hoop stress on passing, shooting, and punting. The underinflated ball takes a relatively larger amount of force to pass the same distance and therefore it occasionally does not travel the entire intended distance. The overinflated ball was harder to control. When passing, extra care was used in an attempt to increase accuracy. When the ball was received, it often bounced off the receiver's foot in unexpected directions, occasionally even bouncing upwards. The correctly inflated ball reacted as it was expected to perform. When it was passed, it easily reaches the target at the intended location and it was kept under control when received. When the ball is underinflated, it falls down faster and is harder to aim. When the ball is overinflated, it becomes significantly harder to aim correctly. It also hurts a bit when kicked. For perfect inflation, the ball can be shot accurately each time and it will perform predictably. When the ball is underinflated, it will not travel as far and it will not bounce as high when punted. When the ball is overinflated, it will bounce considerably higher upon hitting the ground or a player, making it harder to control or trap. When the ball is ideally inflated, it will travel and bounce predictably, making it easier to control. We hope you enjoyed watching our video on the hoop stress in soccer balls. 
Thanks for watching. watching.